It's November 16th, 2017. Welcome to another Sports Talk Line, where we talk sports 24-7, 365. I'm your host, Stephen Vanover, here to talk Cowboys Talk Line with Pro Football Talk Line Senior Analyst, for the Cowboys, Ben Grimaldi. Good day, sir. How you doing? What is going on, Steve and Connor? Well, I'm glad that you asked what's going on because we are not alone today. We also have Connor Livesafe. Good day, sir. Welcome to the show. Good day, everybody. I hope you guys are doing well. Oh, man. I, I mean, everybody's doing as well as they can be expected. I, I'm still kind of in numb aftershock. What about you, Ben? Uh, I'm rounding into form, Steve, here for, for week 11 and the Eagle game. Uh, I don't have a terrible feeling about this weekend, to be honest. You know, I like the way that we match up with the Eagles. I always have. Uh, the injuries are my biggest concern rather than playing for the, uh, them playing the Eagles. The Eagles don't scare me. The injuries do. Oh, for sure. So, Connor, what do you think, man? I mean, you know, the game's coming up. Uh, what's your take on what's, you know, going to be happening? I mean, like you guys both said, um, if both squads were 100% healthy, which the Eagles pretty much are, it would be a much different feeling. Um, unfortunately for the Cowboys, they have a lot of injuries right now. Sean Lee, Dan Bailey, Tyron Smith, um, even Des Bryant's a little shaken up. So to have four of your five or six best players injured, and then we're not even talking about Ezekiel Elliott yet, has to leave you with a little bit of unpleasant feeling. Um, but like you guys said, for some reason, it makes no sense, but I kind of have a good feeling about Sunday night. Um, it's Again, we don't really have a reason to feel that way. They kind of <laughs> crap, crap the bed last week, and then they're even – more banged up this week than they were last week, but for some reason I still feel pretty good about their chances. Yeah, I don't know what it is, man. Is it something in the air, something in the water? <laughs> it's like, okay. I, I, <laughs> it's it's weird. You know, we all have that same kind of good feeling. I wonder if it all cancels out and, and they play like trash again. We could all be blamed. Let's, let's play a little pro-con, if you will, um, some devil's advocate. I'm going to talk about a situation in the game, and uh, let's take turns. One person talk about how it can go bad, and then the other person, let's, uh, why don't you talk about, you know, how the Cowboys can actually turn this to, uh, to a positive. Sure. And uh, we'll start off, and uh, Ben, we'll give you the devil's advocate role here to start off. Wentz has been on fire. One of the things that he started to do is he started to find up the seam. He started to work in the tight end into the mix. That's going to put a lot of pressure on Byron Jones, right? Yeah, it's going to put a lot of pressure on Byron Jones, who's had a real uneven year. He's had a, a lot of good, but there's been some 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 games where he's he hasn't looked as good as as we had all hoped. Well, being uh, the devil's advocate, how, how can that go bad? I mean, what you know, what, what has to happen? <laughs> it could, well, it could go really bad because the Cowboys uh, <laughs> linebacker-wise, they got some issues. And without Sean Lee and their as their best coverage linebacker, uh, and a banged up and gimpy Jalen Smith who doesn't need to be out there o over fifteen or twenty plays a game, but he's he's out there almost full time. Uh, maybe we see some Justin Durant and his old butt getting dragged back out there. So uh, it's, it, it could go real wrong because they don't have anybody capable in the linebackers of covering anybody in the team, Zach Ertz, uh, Trey Burton, anybody. Uh, so it could go real bad there, and it could go real bad if Byron Jones doesn't have a real good game. And we're also probably not going to see Jeff Heath, who's, who's had a concussion. So uh, we're getting down to the nitty-gritty here with, with people who are out and people who can cover the seam against Wentz and Ertz and whoever else, Nelson Aguilar and the, and the slot, all that good stuff. All right. Well, there you go. Mr. Devil's Advocate himself has spoken. And now, Connor, <laughs> you get to bring the good news, all right? How can the Cowboys handle this, and what do they have to do in order to do that? You know, 
One thing that I think the Cowboys actually do have the advantage of on defense, which we don't say very often, is matching up against Philly, they probably can get away with playing a lot of nickel and a lot of dime, which what I think we may end up seeing is seeing a lot of Damian Wilson and Anthony Hitchens. So we might see a lot of their 4-2-5 style defense, uh, four defense linemen, two linebackers, and then whatever five cover defensive backs they want to put on the field. Um, again, I'm spinning this positively, so Chidobe Awuzie will finally looks like he's going to get some playing time this week. Whether that's safety or corner, it seems like he's going to be on the field. Um, and then if while also spinning this positively, Jeff Heath hasn't been a very great uh, safety this year. He's struggled in coverage. His tackling has been inconsistent, um, and that's probably putting it a little nicely. So Xavier Woods will probably slide in and play uh, starting safety if Jeff Heath can't go, which it sounds like he's not going to be able to. So we may get an upgrade at safety, um, believe it or not, and then with Awuzie coming in and playing, he may play down as like that nickel linebacker who will cover some of the tight ends and also cover some of the receivers as well. So we may actually get better coverage on the field than we're used to with the uh, Cowboys defense. Man, you've been hanging around Grimaldi too much. You sight weight and just took away <laughs> my next question, man. I, I thought that was Grimaldi's kick. I, he, he was always doing that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but that is the next question I was going to bring up, and, and you jumped right into it. With Jeff Heath not being on the field, is this an upgrade or a downgrade? Now, and you pretty much answered it. You know, you called it an upgrade. Ben, what do you think? Uh, for sure, I think it's an upgrade because I think we all want to see uh, more Xavier Woods. I think Woods has been steadily increasing the playing time, and we're seeing plenty of him now, and, and that makes us all happy. Uh, but here's a little bit of the downside. You know, Woozy is going to play, and they like the way you, he, he, he's got that versatile style where they can bring him down towards the line of scrimmage and play a little bit safety, and they're going to move him around a little bit. Uh, a little bit of the negative of that is he hasn't played in weeks. And now you're missing your starting safety, and now you have communication issues with guys who are being put in different positions than they have been in the last few weeks. So you get a lot of moving parts. Not to say that it can't work, uh, but on the cautious side, let's just say, hey, Wuzier uh, is a rookie too. So there's a little bit of trepidation with, you know, he's coming back off injury. He hasn't played much. He's a rookie. There's a lot of moving pieces here uh, against an offense that's, and steamrolling people. So, so uh, one wrong move, and, and it's going to go a long way for, for six for the Eagles. So the Cowboys have to be uh, – they got to play sound, smart, assignment football on defense, and, and hopefully everybody does their jobs and Ouzier can, can play up to his potential and, and, and have him do what the Cowboys want him to do. Yeah, you make a good point. I'd be a lot more excited about him being tried out in this elephant role, if you will, moving him around – Using him as like the passing linebacker, so to so to speak, up close to the line in, in some formations. If it was the only change that they were doing, that lots of moving parts aspect that you mentioned, that always concerns me, especially when you're doing young guys. Yeah, but you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of with Connor here. I, I think they get more talent on the field, more speed, more versatility. Uh, I just think we'll, we should be a little bit trep, uh, a little bit worried about what it's all going to look like when they're all out there basically for the first time, and it's week 11. Okay, uh, let's jump right to it, the question that I really do not know the answer to. I know what I'd like the answer to be, um, but I, I don't know the answer. What are the Cowboys going to do at running back? And how are they going to employ that person when they use them? Anybody? I, I mean, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, if it was me, I would play Rod Smith. Uh, maybe not quite the workload that we see Ezekiel Elliott play, but maybe split it up, you know, 75%, 10% Alfred Morris, and then give Darren McFadden the rest of those few carries here and there. Um I broke down a lot of Rod Smith's runs earlier in this week, or earlier last week, before his first game, that he really had a role in. 
and I like his power. I like his explosiveness. I like his vision. I like his ability as a receiver and a pass blocker more than Alfred Morris. Um, we saw that a lot on Sunday, actually. Uh, a lot of the third down work, Rod Smith came in and got a lot of that. Uh, those reps. He only got two carries, I think, and I think he averaged eight yards or something. So he averaged four yards per carry on his two carries. But Morris had three really nice runs. I think one of them was a gain of 14, one of them a gain of 12, and then one of them was a gain of 16, I want to say. Other than those three runs, he was pretty much non-existent, and then Darren McFadden's only carry went for negative two yards. Uh, a lot of people have been talking. It's been hard to evaluate the offense as a whole because of how bad the left tackle play was last week. So it's hard for me to put any of the blame on any of the players because how do we know that it was on them when your left tackle couldn't block me coming off the edge? Oh, no kidding. In the running game, he was, uh, they were bringing it down from the backside, chasing everything down, cutting through, disrupting. I mean, it just... Everything was crumbling from that left-hand side. It, it, it was brutal. But and one one thing I did see on uh, the study of the tape I did was once they figured out that Claiborne could pretty much have his way with Chaz Green, they actually had shifted their defensive line and linebackers to play the run to the right. So they were letting Claiborne pretty much single up Chaz Green and almost handle the whole left side of the field and then they were playing their linebackers and shifting their defensive line to just play the right side of the field. And um, it really made the run to the right harder, but they couldn't run to the left either because Claiborne was screaming off the edge and getting in the backfield almost every every snap. Yeah, I saw the same offset that you did. It was pretty obvious, and it made it really tough for the rest of the line to function. Uh Ben, did you see the same thing in the running backs, man? I mean, I I agree with him. I think that that's the guy that's earned his shot. But yeah, I'm 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 in the same boat. I'd like to see Rod Smith get the start. Uh, I think 20 carries from from Smith is probably a little too many. I'd like to see you know that 15 to 18 range for him, and maybe you know six, seven, eight for for uh, Alfred Morris in the backfield. It just feels like the Cowboys don't want to do that. They're more inclined. Uh, to having their veteran do uh, what he needs to do. He, he knows the offense. Uh, he knows the game. He's not going to be surprised by much. And Jim Schwartz is, is going to get after the Cowboys. Uh, he's going to be aggressive. He's going he's to get those pass rushes coming after the Cowboys. They may need a more experienced pass blocker. And, and Rod Smith does a good job at it, uh, but more experienced is Alfred Morris. And I think, I think they value that right now. Uh, especially with the problems that they have on that that left tackle position, that they want to have somebody with a little <laughs> more experience uh, to be in there and is not going to be fooled as easily, and, and that's Alfred Morris. To me, I, I mean, that's a good I, point. I think the majority of Cowboys and Cowboys fans would love to see Rod Smith carry the majority of the load, get 15 to 18 carries. I think that would be the best thing. Uh, it just doesn't seem like uh, the Cowboys coaches are in agreement with the masses on this. Uh, you know, that, that's why I worded this thing at the beginning the way I did because I tend to agree with that as well. I don't think that you can overestimate how important, the importance that the Cowboys coaching staff puts on veterans and, and how they play them and how they view them. Uh, it's, it's definitely pretty high up there on the list. With that in mind, flipping over to the other side of the ball, Ben, let's start with you on this one before we flip back to Connor. We're looking at a linebacker. I'm going to talk about Hitchens. He's the man in the hot seat, okay? It's not Jalen Smith. It's Hitchens that's going to try and replace Sean Lee. Uh-huh. Right, okay. He's the guy that's going to start in Sean Lee's spot. How about that? Is he going to be exposed or is he going to step up? No, I think I think Anthony Hitchens is, is a good, solid linebacker. Uh, he's asked to fill a lot of roles here for the Cowboys. They ask him to do a lot when when guys are out. So he's kind of like that jack of all trades at linebacker for the Cowboys. So he's going to step in, but there's no Sean Lee. Uh, Sean Lee is one of the top three or four linebackers in the game. Uh, he knows the play that's going to be run before it's run. He beats players to the spot. He makes plays. He makes tackles. The defense is absolutely a completely different defense without him. Even if Anthony Hitchens has a game of his life, 
he's still not up to the level of Sean Lee and what he brings to the defense. So he's going to play a role, and he's going to be one of the better players on the, on the defense for the Cowboys because he's going to need to be. Uh, but there's no replacing Sean Lee. He's going to do what he can do. But it's, it's we're asking too much from Anthony Hitchens to, to say, hey, we need you to beat Sean Lee. He's just not capable of that. Connor, what do you think, man? I mean, that's pretty well laid out. I, I can't really disagree with anything he's saying in that regard. I mean, he really is a practice vet. He, he's a professional. He's the guy that you want in there in this situation. But, I mean, it, it, is it enough? No, not at all. Um, ben said it. He, he, <laughs> Don't he, hold back, man. <laughs> he, ben said it. He had the game of his life last week, and they still got absolutely dominated up front. Um, when you're one of 11 defenders playing out of your mind, it doesn't matter. Um, Sean Lee makes that defense what it is. He lines everyone up pre-snap, and then he makes sure everyone's where they're supposed to be as the play's happening. It's just it doesn't matter if you got Ray Lewis there. If there's you know your defensive tackles are getting washed out of the play and then your two other linebackers are hitting the wrong gaps, you can't stop everything by yourself. And, with, you know, Sean Lee out, and if they do play their normal base defense a lot, it's going to be a lot of 4-3-4, four, um, four, and that's just not going to work. I think that's why they're going to have to, you know, do the 4-2-5 that we were talking about, get – five defensive backs on the field and rally to the football because having Jalen Smith or Justin Durant, for that matter, play a significant role, a role that Sean Lee should be playing, is just going to set your defense up for failure. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd really like to see them go with that, you know, they call it a dime-style defense where you got your, your base four defensive linemen and then in the middle of the field you have Damian Wilson and Anthony Hitchens, and then you have five defensive backs that have to rally to the football. Oh, man. I'd like to see that for a whole lot of reasons. Um, but, man, Hitchens, I, that's the whole thing. I, I go back to the in the playoffs. <laughs> Remember against the Lions at, where he was <laughs> – he kind of looked like Sean Bradley losing it there, going in, in pass coverage. He, he gets exposed in pass coverage, and when you're trying to replace Sean Lee, that's what they're asking you to do is, is to take your worst trait and, and rely on it. And I think that, that leverages too much pressure on the guy. And then you point out the loss of leadership, the loss of, of losing your field general they can't bring in a guy to replace that. I mean, the little helmet, you know, the speaker in the helmet doesn't replace that. It just doesn't do it, does it? <laughs> can, can I ask you guys a question real quick? Sure. I want to I, I get you guys' feeling on this. So, this doesn't happen too often anymore in the NFL, but would you guys be interested in a defense where you rush for you have Damian Wilson as an- and Anthony Hitchens as your two linebackers and five defensive backs. Would you be okay with letting either one of Damian Wilson or Anthony Hitchens play as a spy on Carson Wentz the entire game? <laughs> and, the, and, and I and I know I know what you're thinking because I I sat and watched a bunch of Eagles film and I was like. You can't do it because if they do start running the ball, you're you're pretty much just a liability in the run game. But I think if you keep Carson Wentz in the pocket and you keep him from moving sideline to sideline, you might be able to limit their offense because that's when they're the most dangerous is when he gets out of the pocket, he's able to make a defender kind of just bite a little bit coming towards him, and then he can hit that guy running wide open. If you keep him in the pocket, I think you can limit their offense. I think that you you could definitely put a spy on him in certain situations when you know that they're passing. I don't have a problem putting a spy back there and also letting him, you know, cover that short middle as well. But um, beyond that, I mean, like the whole game set him up with that. I I, I don't know. They're going to throw a lot at it. Uh, I think it's going to be tough to stay in that for the whole game. I, I'm all for it. Uh, 
clearly something has to come as a, a surprise to the Eagles. The Cowboys aren't going to line up and, and do what they usually do because doing what they usually do is going to get them beat. Uh, yep. They need to be more aggressive and have a, a more creative game plan on offense and defense. Uh, if you're going to have a spy on Carson Wentz who makes a ton of plays outside the pocket, uh, I'm all for it. I don't think it can be hitching because I don't think he has the athletic ability to, to stay with a, a guy like like Wentz. Even though Wentz isn't, you know, super athletic, uh, he's shifty. He's big and strong. You want to have Wilson be that guy. I'm I'm all for Wilson being that guy. Uh, I'm all for trying it. Uh, I, I'm not sure the Cowboys will do it, but uh, I'm up for anything that's a little bit more creative because they're going to be they're going to need to be creative in this game. Oh, I agree. Yeah, with and that. like. Yeah, and like you said, Ben, I don't think they'll do it either. Just doing a lot of film study on the you know, Philadelphia offense, they don't move the ball as much as you think they do when Wentz is sitting in the pocket having to scan the field. Um, he makes those big plays when he's you know, running to his left, running to his right. And just if you have somebody that's in his face, not necessarily blitzing him or rushing him, but just in his face, knowing – you, you're not getting past me. You're not getting over the, my head. That that might limit their offense. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm here talking with you guys, so if I was that much of a genius, I'm sure I'd be on the sideline somewhere. <laughs> but I just <laughs> I, I see that he, people are making Wentz out to be like he's some great pocket passer, and a lot of his success has come after contact when someone's hit him and he's gotten around spun out of trouble, and then he hit someone deep. He made a play in the Denver game a few weeks ago where the you know, the, the, the play design was to get him moving as soon as the ball touched his hands. He moved to his right. Uh, Keeb Tlaib bit on that, came up a little bit, and then he hit Alshon Joffrey, who was wide open, you know, three yards behind him because they were so worried about Wentz running. So if you can limit that, I think you got a really good shot to limit their offense. Uh, you know, I think that's actually something you bring up that's, uh, where they're a lot alike uh, in that regard. Uh, Prescott and Wentz, statistically, they are both much better co- uh, quarterbacks outside the pocket, aren't they? Yep, for Dak like is said, for sure. For different Dak reasons. Dak is for sure, but I, I think Dak's gotten real darn good. Yeah, I, I think Dak's gotten real darn good in the pocket, too. So, I agree. Uh, they're both. They're both really, really special when they're outside the pocket. If and, you can limit, so I like your idea. The, I like your idea in that regard of like you know anything that the Cowboys are going to do, you know, to to stop that. And then alluding to what Ben said earlier, you know, it's the old Jimmy Johnson thing. You know, what do you do when you're in a fight with a 300 pound gorilla? You know, you hit him with everything you got. You you don't hold mm-hmm. back. And the Cowboys have got their backs up against the wall. You wrote about that earlier this week, right, Ben? Yeah, I mean, it's not win or go home. It's not that dire, but lose this game and the rest of the season is kind of like win or go home. So they're they're in a desperate situation. And sometimes when you're desperate, uh, you you tend to play your best football, especially against a rival, especially when they're coming off a bye week where I don't think the Eagles necessarily wanted a bye week. They were they were rolling. Uh, they didn't need the time off, but they got it. So hopefully, uh, hopefully there's a little bit of momentum taken out of their sails, and hopefully the Cowboys, playing as a desperate team, uh, come in ready to play uh, one of their better games of the season because they're going to need it. Yeah, I think that bye week slump will actually get the Cowboys a quarter to jump out on top, and then after that, I I, I think that the Eagles will start to get in rhythm, and then the second quarter will will really detail where the game's going to go in that regard. Connor, you know, with you, you were talking about the, the defensive thing there, and I thought that was some great insight. On the game overall, what do you think is going to be the biggest tweak? What do you think, you know, what is gonna what is this game going to turn on? I think it depends on how your left tackle plays. Um, there's been reports flying around that Tyron Smith's already been ruled out for this game. Uh, Mike Fisher reported that he thinks that Tyron Smith's going to play. If your all-pro left tackle doesn't play and you have to turn to Chaz Green or Byron Bell, against that <coughs> defensive front, it's going to be a tough, tough day, or night, I should say, for the Cowboys offense. Um, Philly's defense, the front seven, is probably the best 
uh, in the league, if I had to say, with Vinnie Curry, Brandon Graham, Fletcher Cox, Timmy Jernigan. Um, linebackers aren't great. You can expose them, but that front four is very, very good. And uh, we saw last week what a mediocre defensive end can do to Chaz Green at left tackle, and I really do not want to find out what Brandon Graham or Vinnie Curry or Fletcher Cox can do. So I think – I don't think I, th- I know the Cowboys coaching staff is going to be more prepared for that this week. They're going to have to find a better way to help help if Tyron Smith doesn't go. Um, but I think it all comes down to left tackle. If Tyron Smith plays, I think the Cowboys have a really good chance of winning this football game. Um, and if he doesn't, they better have all their cards in check because if not, it's going to be a long day again. Oh yeah. Long day at Red Rock, totally. I, I saw the movie. It did not end well, okay? It just It really did not end well. Uh, ben, what do you think? I mean, is, is that it? Is, is it going to be the left tackle, or do you think something else is going to make this you know, this matchup twist and turn? I mean, the offensive line is, is definitely the biggest issue uh, going for the Cowboys. And like Connor said, I mean, it, it doesn't look like Tyron Smith's going to play. So it's going to be Byron Bell. Or, or uh, Chaz Green. It looks like it's going to be Byron Bell. We're going to try something new, and and I'm in total agreement with Connor. They're they're gonna they're gonna be putting somebody over there to help. The, the game plan is going to be completely different. They're not going to leave either of the left tackles up there on the island very much, uh, if at all. Uh, I think you can beat the Eagles because they're ultra aggressive on that defensive line. Man, they're flying forward. Sometimes you got to change up what you do to combat the aggressiveness. Uh, so if you can get them rushing upfield and take some of the underneath stuff, the Cowboys have the players with the ball in space to, to wreak havoc on, on the Eagles' defense. The front four for them is, is phenomenal. But they're also extremely aggressive, so you can use that to your advantage in your offensive game plan. And, and let's have some more crossers. Let's see Des Bryant coming across the middle. Let's u- utilize Cole Beasley. Uh, let, let's get these guys in space to do some damage after uh, after the ultra aggressive defensive line for the for the Eagles. Schwartz likes loves to be aggressive and get after you, so they can use that to their advantage and hopefully uh, hopefully make some big plays and and hopefully back off some of those guys for the Eagles up front. You know, the, I actually think the the passing game is going to be the path to salvation for the Cowboys right now as well and the short passing game specifically. Connor, I'm curious. Do you think they're going to do it by just taking and putting, you know, they've got the six-footers the Cowboys can put on the wings. They can also split out some tight ends there and, and then just work that game, which they can do against the Eagles. Or do you think it's time to, you know, go small? Do you think they're actually really going to push uh, the two tiny uh, slot guys that they have on the field at the same time and say, hey, let's work the short game? Nope. And it's unfortunate because I think that that would be a great success into beating the Eagles. But the Cowboys coaching staff, for whatever reason, does not like the idea of Ryan Switzer playing offense. I think he's logged. He has two catches on the season, and I think he, the last two weeks, I don't think he's registered a single offensive snap. Um, So that, for whatever reason, they don't trust him as a receiver yet, and they're starting to not trust him as a punt returner. I think you're going to see the Cowboys line up and play their same offense that they normally play, um, which some people are okay with that. Some people think that that kind of has to change when, again, your all-pro left tackle's out, your all-pro running back out, um, and then your all-pro receiver is a little dinged up. Um, it's, it's a risky move because we talked about uh, the Philadelphia front four, if you know Des Bryant can't get open because he's a little dinged up, he can't run routes to create separation. Philadelphia <laughs> doubles Cole Beasley and Jason Witten, which is a lot of what a lot of teams have been doing this year. And then Terrence Williams doesn't have a career day like he did a couple weeks ago. Dak Prescott's going to get sacked six or seven times again, and I promise that'll happen. Um, it's it's I, I, I sent out a tweet and I wrote an article a few days ago that the Cowboys don't have a receiver right now that can get open and create separation on a consistent basis. It was Cole Beasley. Teams have figured him out or bracketing him with a linebacker and a safety or a corner and a linebacker. 
and teams are really putting Des Bryant out on an island with whatever cornerback they want to stick on him, and so far it's proved to be successful for opposing defenses. So I think you're going to see a lot of what we've been seeing this year, and that's you know Des Bryant, wide receiver one, Cole Beasley in the slot, Jason Witten as an inline tight end, and Terrence Williams on the other side. And I don't disagree with that. I I have teed Terrence Williams as being the guy that's going to need to step forward. I think he's the guy that can run the slants and make the inside game under pressure work for the Cowboys to move the chains, and it's going to take that type of thing. And, man, you detailed something really important. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more in it in regards to, you know, it's really good to be able to dictate and come out and say, hey, we know that you know what we're going to do, but we're going to do it anyhow, and then go ahead and run the ball and do X, Y, and Z and run the same offense. But when you don't have the parts and pieces, when it's not working, well, we saw what happened last week. They came out and refused to make an adjustment. And, wow, it, it was horrible. It was ugly. If they don't make an adjustment in between last week and this week, other than just changing a player, I fear more of the same. Exactly, and and you, you know, you said it, and I was touching on it. If they continue to send Des Bryant fifteen yards down the field, Terrence Williams fifteen yards down the field, and Jason Witten and Cole Beasley are getting double team or bracketed, Dak Prescott will get sacked six or seven times again because no one's going to get open and that front four is going to be on his ass by the time he's, you know, receivers are looking for the ball. And it's just, it's like you said, if, if, if it's not working, you have to change it. There's, there's that, I, I say it a lot of times, this coaching staff seems to be a little stubborn in the way they do things. Sometimes that's not a bad thing because you can just pound it into the ground. You can run the ball on first down and 10, and everyone knows it's coming, and you still get five yards. But when that five yards turns into two yards, then you have to change something. Yeah, that's the thing right there. I agree, when it turns to two. Uh, Well, uh, there you go. You and I both are playing the devil's advocate on that one, it seems. (laughs) Uh, Well, we're actually going to move on to what is uh, Ben's favorite part of any show that we do. (laughs) Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and we're going to let him lead, man, because, I mean, I know he's chomping at the bit to do just this. Uh, ben, uh, player of the game and uh, and the score, my man. If the Cowboys are going to win, the player of the game has to be Dak Prescott. It's, it's, it's the only way. <laughs> if they're going to win the game, it's going to be on Dak Prescott's shoulders. He's big enough to handle it. He's big enough to do it. Uh, I have a really good feeling about it. That doesn't mean the Cowboys win. I think it's similar to last year's game where the Cowboys were rolling and they had a bye week and Philadelphia came and handed it to them in the first half and and the Cowboys wound up winning in overtime. Uh, I see something similar happen where the Cowboys are going to give it to them early, but the the Eagles will settle down. Uh, (laughs) It's hard to see the Cowboys winning even though I have a good feeling. So I'm going to say the Eagles uh, 31-28. Um, uh, there you go. I mean, you know, it, I'm surprised that like it, maybe everybody's going to pick a score similar to this. Connor, what about you? Score, player of the game. Good news or bad news for Cowboys Nation here? Again, I said it. You know, first off, I for whatever reason, I don't know. I don't know why. I makes no sense. I can't tell you why. But I think the Cowboys somehow win it, and I think it's going to be a low scoring game, which is something the Eagles haven't been in this year. Um, I really don't think the Cowboys offense is going to be able to move the ball with tons of success. So I'm going to give them 17, and I'm going to give the Eagles 14. And I think it's kind of what Ben said. It's going to be back and forth. Uh, Cowboys come out hot. You know, Cowboys Nation's losing their minds, thinking that the team's coming back. And then after halftime, it kind of settles down, and Eagles score a couple touchdowns and get right back into it. I think the player of the game um, is actually going to be a guy we kind of talked a little down on is uh, Ryan Switzer. I think he's going to make a huge special teams play. Uh, we've, we've seen the past few weeks, we saw it tonight in the Steelers-Titans game, that special teams win games, block kick. Um, I think Switzer gives us a, a either really good field position or actually scores a touchdown as a punt returner or kick returner this week, and he's going to get talked about a little bit more after this weekend. Well, well, I like yours better than Ben's. I, <laughs> <laughs> so, so do I. <laughs> uh, uh, well, 
Mine, actually, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring on this going around. Uh, I was very close to you, uh, Connor, and and normally I'm I'm trying to pick Ben's pocket over there. I pick a final score of 1912. I think it's going to be a slugfest. I think the Cowboys are going to come out on top. I think how they're going to come out on top is the player of the game is going to be Jordan Lewis, and he just keeps getting better. Guys aren't even throwing at his way anymore, but I think Carson Wentz has a big ego. I think he throws wherever he wants, but he also gets a little lazy with the ball. And if you get lazy around this kid, he's going to eat you up. It's time for a pick six from the kid, and that's going to be the difference in why the Cowboys bring home the bacon. I like that would be that would be fantastic. I got one more question for you guys, and then I'll shut up for the rest of the for the rest of the show. <laughs> We're gonna let you end it, man. This is it. This is the final <laughs> question. So yeah. Are you guys worried at all about the Philadelphia run game? Because I'm not. I don't think that they can run the ball as great as people make it seem to be. I think they got you know their all pro left tackle out as well. I think if you stop the run and keep Carson Wentz in the pocket, you can win this football game. Uh, if you let them run wild like they have when Sean Lee hasn't been on the field and Carson Wentz is, you know, running sideline to sideline, throwing the ball 30 yards down the field, there's no way. But if you limit their run game, which their leading rusher is LeGarrette Blunt, he's got 504 yards on the year, and then their next leading rusher is Carson Wentz with 211 yards. If you limit those two guys, I think you got a, posi- a good good position to win the game. Ben, why don't you take this? Yeah, one, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm of the same same mindset. I know me and Connor went back and forth on Twitter when when the the Eagles picked up a jai, and I said that doesn't scare me. It doesn't do anything for me because they really don't run the ball a ton, and they really don't even try to run the ball a lot. Uh, they love to throw to set, uh, to set up the run. So I don't see their running game doing much, and, and it's partly because uh, they don't really care about the run that much. Um, yeah, and I mean, like, like you it said, I think uh, me because of its big play potential, because of they, they added a guy. I think he fits yeah. how they actually do run. They don't try and use the run, you know, as as an element to dictate anything. They do what Ben said, you know. They do other things to set up the run. But I, I like the Cowboys' run defense a lot better before they went through two starting nose tackles. Uh, um, yeah. But the dynamic front of, of moving, you know, Malik Collins and David Irving back and forth between those two positions, I like that so much better. It doesn't matter. I, I like this front four better. I, I'm with you guys. I, I think they can shut it down. What does scare me, though, is the big play with JJ. Yeah, and that's where it'll come back to get you is – which last week I think he had, you know, he only had a handful of snaps at running back. But actually, LeGarrette Blunt's their kind of running back they really don't ever have many problems with. They they struggle more with those quicker, shiftier, you know, more explosive guys. If if they can bottle up LeGarrette Blunt and allow Ajayi to only have, you know, 10, 10 carries for 50 yards or somewhere in that, you know, good game but he didn't kill us range, I think they'll be okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll go with that. I'll go with that. Well, uh, well, guys, I want to thank uh, both of you for being here. Uh, ben, take a minute and uh, tell us about what you write on ProFootballTalkLine.com. I can't believe I waited till now to get in my shameless plug. I'm slipping, man. I'm slipping. <laughs> you need to do it at least twice a show, Steve. Uh, well, I, uh, I, I got Connor can, yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> you can always catch me on Twitter at Ben Grimaldi is simple as can be, and then every week we'll, we'll find out uh, if the Cowboys win or lose. We're putting up the vents if they lose, and I vent the frustration for all Cowboy fans. Uh, and this year we put up five gloats where the Cowboys win, and, and we gloat and laugh at the Eagles fans because they think they're really good, and the Cowboys are going to beat them this week. And We get to gloat about it until the next week. And then Monday we have extra points where we, we go over a few things that you may have missed in the game that, that we kind of noticed. And then Tuesdays with Jerry where we we talk about uh, Jerry's weekly radio spot. We kind of poke fun at him there. And then Thursday, we always have a, a slight review and, and a little bit of a preview for this week's game. So you can catch me four or five times weekly on ProFootballTalk.com and, of course, always on Twitter, at Ben Grimaldi. 
All right, man. And where's a drum roll when you need one? That's just so smooth. I love you. I'm envious the way you, you lay that out. Connor, uh, you covered the Cowboys for I don't know how long, and you'll be covering uh, still, uh, but you primarily covered the NFL draft for ProFootballTalkLine.com. There's number two. I did it. Okay. Uh, uh, why don't you tell us about that, how to find you on Twitter, and about what you do there? Sure. You can uh, follow me on Twitter at ConnorX147, C-O-N-N-O-R-X147. Um, and, yeah, like you said, I covered the Cowboys for a couple years uh, for the site. And then in the last shoot, year, year and a half, two years, I kind of transitioned to taking over the draft cycle. And I spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, I like it. It's great. I don't have a team in college football, so it keeps my – biased out of it, <laughs> unlike the Cowboys where I always have, you know, a preference towards them. But, uh, you know, it's a lot of draft stuff, but also on Twitter I mainly talk about Cowboys and then I talk about draft as well. But a lot of my articles and a lot of my uh, work for the site will be for, towards the draft and the occasional Cowboys piece. So follow me on Twitter and then check out my work on, like you said, profootballtalk.com. Oh, well done. That was number three. I, I'm, I'm so <laughs> proud the way that we finished that, guys. Teamwork all the way around. Uh, and, hey, for everyone listening, I can't say enough about following these guys on Twitter, especially on game day. They go back and forth. Some really good insights. You never know when one of them might be at the game itself. That's at Ben Grimaldi and at ConnorX147. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Steve. Of course. Thanks, Steve. And for everyone that's been here taking time out, out of your day to tune in and listen, we certainly appreciate it. Until next time, listen like you play with intensity.